to nowhere Everything I tried had turned out wrong It seemed I'd lost the reason to get up every morning I'd lost all hope and lost my song Circumstances said I wouldn't make it Oh, but that was all before I met the man Who put his arms around me I heard him say forgiven I knew I'd never be the same again Then and there Said on and done Then and there Victory won No more walking on my own No more facing life alone No more struggling With guilt and despair Faith has been made signs And we stand oh. before No more burdens to bear New life began Then and there Then and there New life began Baptist Church on this August the 11th, and what a blessing it has been to hear the reports of souls being saved and lives changed throughout the summer through camps, Bible schools, and soul winning. God's Word is so powerful. And while we're looking forward to being home in a few days, and we thank God for time to rest and study, I'm thankful that this morning Dr. John Getch, the Executive Vice President of West Coast Baptist College, a longtime partner with us in the ministry, is going to stand in the pulpit and once again proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ. And I want to encourage you to open up your heart today and let God speak to your heart. Let God encourage and challenge you. Maybe there's someone here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. This morning, I encourage you to consider that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And Dr. John Getch has preached that message in all 50 states and in many foreign countries. And I know he'll be a blessing to you if you open your heart to the preaching this morning. So let's be ready and let's receive the word of God today. Well, good morning and thank you for being in your place on this summer Sunday morning. It's uh, getting close to the school time. I was in Atlanta a couple weeks ago and they were already in school. Schools in Atlanta started July 29th. I thought, what is wrong with this country? We are going down fast. But uh, it's great to be back in Lancaster and good to see you here today. And I uh, know that the uh, children's singing and just their presence was a real encouragement to us this morning. And uh, let me thank you parents again for making uh, the Kids Blast a part of their summer schedule. And I know that uh, that was a blessing to them and hopefully to you as well. Well, let's go to the book of Hosea, the book of Hosea in chapter 4 in your scriptures this morning. If you'd like to follow along in the uh, worship guide that you received. The scriptures are there for you that we'll read here as our text. 
in the outline, but Hosea chapter 4, and we'll start with verse number 1, and I'll read down to verse number 6. Hosea chapter 4, and starting with verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there's no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out, and blood toucheth blood. Therefore shall the land mourn, and everyone that dwelleth therein shall languish with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of the heaven. Yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. Yet let no man strive nor reprove another, for thy people are as they that strive with the priest. Therefore shalt thou fall in that day, and the prophet also shall fall with thee in the night, and I will destroy thy mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. And thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. The legendary story is told of a man who made his living by juggling. He was renowned. He traveled far and wide across this country, performing at various events, particularly circuses and so on. He was very skilled, very agile with his hands, and he could juggle just about anything. In fact, often in the crowd, people would throw things at him and ask him to juggle or balance these things, and he was uh, just unparalleled in his ability to do so. The man was consumed with his work, with his job, if you please. He loved the crowds. He loved the applause. He loved the attention. It fed him, and wanted to make, he wanted to be better and better all of the time. His life was consumed with travel and, and performance. He didn't have time, really, to get married or have a family or things of that nature. And well into his middle age, he enjoyed the life that he was living. As he reached that midlife point in time, he thought, you know, I've been just about everywhere you can go. I've performed in the greatest venues in the world. I've received the applause of men. Maybe it's time for me to change a little bit. He thought, you know, I've made enough money. I could live anywhere I want to live. I could go anywhere I want to go. And Honestly, he was a little tired of the constant pressure of performing and the, the people always wanting something bigger, something better for him that he could do. And so he decided to take his money, he had made a lot of it, and travel. And he thought, I'll get on a boat and I'll, I'll travel the world and wherever I find a place that's quiet, a place that I like, a place where maybe I can settle down, I'll... I'll get off that boat, and that's where I'll live the rest of my life. Perhaps meet someone I can marry and have a family even, perhaps. He thought, I, I need to take my wealth with me, but he didn't want to carry his money with him, obviously, on this trip. So he thought, I need to buy something, something of value, something that I could, I could cash in no matter where I go in the world and, and receive my money back so that I can live. And he, he thought about that for a bit and finally made his way to a diamond store. And he bought a very rare and valuable diamond. It was about the size that fit comfortably into the palm of his hand. A very expensive diamond. He put hundreds of thousands of his dollars into this purchase. He placed it in a locked box and into his luggage and began his journey. On board the ship, the days grew wearisome and tiresome as people were traveling by boat in those days and those uh, days and weeks on the ocean oftentimes were much the same day after day. And one day someone said, hey, aren't you the guy that juggles? Aren't you the guy that's performed? And they began to list different places. And he finally admitted he was the man. They said, hey, uh, uh, entertain us. I mean, uh, the, the, we need something to entertain us on this boat. Uh, here, juggle this. And he consented again. He enjoyed the attention. He enjoyed the crowd. And so he, he took the items and he began to juggle. And the people oohed and odd, and they loved it. 
And they would give him other things, and he would, he would juggle it. And they wanted more. They wanted something better, something a little more daring, something with a little more risk. And they said, do some more, do some more. And finally, he was getting a bit agitated. And he said, wait here, I'll be back in five minutes. He made his way to his cabin and unlocked his luggage, took out that box and unlocked it, and took out that very expensive and rare diamond made his way back to the deck. He showed the crowd that beautiful rare stone and explained the hundreds of thousand dollars he had paid for it. And he said, you want to see something? You want to see some risk? He went over to the side of the ship and he leaned over the edge, over the water, and he threw that diamond into the air. The crowd watched breathlessly as that diamond spiraled into the sky and then back down toward his hand, and with ease, with skill, with agility, he caught the diamond before it reached the water. The crowd uh, roared with approval, and they said, more, more, more. And so again, he took that diamond and reached over the rail and threw it a little bit higher. This time the crowd gasped as it seemed to almost disappear and now began its descent and they watched as he carefully and quickly snatched it before it hit the water. Again, they roared their applause, more, more, more. And the man now with a stern look took that diamond, reached over the edge of that boat and with every ounce of strength he had, he threw it high into the sky. The crowd watched now as it disappeared for a moment in the glistening sun, and soon it appeared again, and they watched as he, with steady hand, waited. And as that diamond approached his hand, the boat hit a wave. It jolted the boat just enough to the left. The diamond hit the edge of his fingers and slipped into the murky waters. Lost. Forever. The nation of Israel had gambled with God's instructions here and lost. You know, it's never wise for us to have a controversy with God. Did you notice God's words in verse 1? Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. I've often wondered, as God looks at America tonight, if he doesn't have a controversy with us. Why was God upset with these people? Why was God at odds with the nation of Israel at this point in history? Well, verse 1 tells us there was no truth. There was no mercy. There was no knowledge of God. Sound like the news? No truth. No mercy. No knowledge of God. And in their place, we find in verse 2, there was swearing and lying and murder and stealing and adultery. Gambling, that they could ignore God and embrace sin and get by with it. What are we risking this morning at the casino of life? What of God's instruction today are we hurling into the air? Gambling, that somehow when we get ready to catch it, it will be secure. How much can we afford to lose? Oh, we think our lies, our dishonesty, our murders, our adulteries, our inward blasphemy of God is all covered. But the Bible says there's nothing covered. All is revealed. Oh God, thou knowest my foolishness, my secret sins are not hid from thee. If we have forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hands to a strange God, will not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. 
Jeremiah said, can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? Do not I fill the heavens and the earth? We think, oh, no one knows about my lies. No one knows about my adultery. No one knows that I stole that at the store. Nobody knows of my blasphemy, my cursing of God. Nobody knows. That's all in my heart. But the psalmist said, whither shall I go from thy spirit? Whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, the darkness and the light are both alike unto thee. The darkness hideth not from thee. The darkness and the light are both alike unto thee. My friend, God's hand is on your boat. And all he has to do is cause a little jolt in your life. And suddenly, all that you've gambled with is gone. Verse 6 of this chapter reveals four devastating losses that we suffer when we gamble with God's instruction. We see first a lost foundation. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Now, no structure will stand the test of time without a proper foundation. Here in the Antelope Valley, we we live in a desert, and I grew up in the Midwest of our country, and things are a little bit different as far as constructing buildings here as opposed to where I grew up. I remember when this building was being constructed, this worship center, I remember uh, seeing those early excavations of the, of the area here, and these big uh, 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 machines came in, and they began digging out all this dirt. They were piling up dirt everywhere, these big mountains of dirt all over this campus, and, and they were digging this huge hole in the ground, and I thought to myself, wow, I, I thought I looked at those plans. I don't remember having a basement. I don't hear too many basements here in the Antelope Valley. Where I grew up, basements are pretty common. We go there during tornadoes or whatever. And, and, and yet I, I didn't think the church had a, was building a basement. And yet they were digging down and down and down and removing all this dirt and piling it up. And boy, I thought we we're building the world's largest swimming pool right here on the campus of Lancaster Baptist Church. Then one day I came to work and they were putting all that dirt back in the hole. All these mountains of dirt were disappearing. They were putting it all back. And I thought, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my life. We're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to dig a hole and then fill it back up. And when I inquired about it, they said, oh, that has to be done. Because in the desert, you have air pockets under the ground. And if you don't dig that dirt out and then pack it down layer by layer by layer, if you just put a slab on the ground and start building, those air pockets will collapse at some point and the building will fall. Every building has to have a proper foundation. Can I say this morning, ladies and gentlemen, our lives need the foundation of God's Word, the knowledge of God's Word. Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 7 that whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and keepeth them, I'll liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house and could not shake it because it was founded upon a rock. But he said, Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and keepeth them not, I'll liken them unto a foolish man which built his house on the sand. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. May I ask you, what are you building your life upon this morning? What is the foundation of your life? What, what do you revolve your life around? What is it that you are building upon today? Is it your career? Your job? Your occupation? Is it your sphere of friends and family and, 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 and those to whom you associate with? Is that your foundation? What are you building your life on? My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. What can you afford to lose this morning of the knowledge of God? Can you afford to gamble away 
his word in your life. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Have you opened this book this week? Have you hid God's word in your heart this week? Have you meditated on the scriptures this week? Thy word is a lamp under my feet. You say, I'm busy. I, I've got so much to do. I, I don't have time. I'm, I'm just thankful I could be in church for an hour today. Listen, what are you building your life on? My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. The grass withereth, the flower falleth, but the words of our God shall stand forever. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Is your foundation the word of God? This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make the way prosperous, then thou shalt have good success. These people gambled with the knowledge of God, they threw it in the air, and they lost a lost foundation. But secondly, we see a lost favor. In verse 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. And thou shalt be no priest to me. Do you need the favor of God? Do you need the blessing of God? Do you need God's help? Do you suppose you'll need God to answer a prayer this coming week? Or are you handling life on your own? You're okay with just kind of going it on your own. You'll figure it out. You'll make it. Can you handle life on your own? Can you handle the tragedies on your own? You're going to handle death on your own? Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Friends, we need the favor of God. We need the blessing of God. We need the hand of God upon our life. For we're not sufficient of ourselves to think anything is of ourselves. Our sufficiency is of God. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. John said a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Friends, we are not self-made men. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above. And cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Everything we have, everything we enjoy, everything that is favorable in our life is a, is a blessing and a gift from God. You can't leave this service without Him. You need His blessing. You need His hand. I'll tell you, we're living in a culture today where you better have God just going to Walmart. Now, I'm not joking. There were some folks this week that needed him bad at Walmart. We live in a culture you don't dare walk down the street. You don't dare walk out of your house. You don't dare do your job. You don't dare do your ministry without the blessing of God. These people had gambled with the favor of God. They threw it in the air and lost. A lost foundation. A lost favor. I think of Samson, who in the Old Testament was a man under a Nazarite vow. Samson was born of godly parents, and God had chosen Samson to be a deliverer to the nation of Israel. He was to be one of the judges that would finally deliver Israel from the Philistines. And so he was a Nazarite by vow. He was not to drink anything or eat anything that came of the vine. He was to never touch a dead animal or object. He was never to have his hair cut. 
But Samson disregarded that vow. He got careless with it. He gambled with it. He drank. He caroused. Loosened his morals. One day, saw a dead lion in the way and saw that the bees had made some honey there in the carcass of the lion, and he took that honey because he was hungry. He touched that dead object, laughed it off, made a riddle about it to trick the Philistines. Soon we find Samson sleeping in the lap of Delilah, who's lied and deceived him. Now as he sleeps, she cuts his hair. The Nazarite vow thrown in the air. In verse 20 of Judges 16, she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep. It's a neat phrase. He awoke out of his sleep, which is what I'd like to see some of you do today. Awake out of your sleep. He awoke out of his sleep, and he said, I'll go out as at other times and shake myself. He realized he had thrown that Nazarite vow away. He realized he had gambled with the favor of God. But he said, it's all right. I can handle this. I, I can do it on my own. He shook himself. I'll handle this. I'll take those Philistines. I'll kill them. But the Bible says he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. He thought, I can handle this. I thought, he, I, he thought, I can do this on my own. But he didn't realize the favor of God was gone. And one of these days, we will be awakened from our selfish, sensual, sinful slumber. As trouble and trial and travesty comes into our life, and we'll go out as at other times, we'll shake ourselves and we'll think, I'll do it in my religion, I'll do it in my experience, I'll, I'll do it in my, 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 my association with God in the past. And you won't realize that long ago you threw the favor of God into the air. And now, when you need Him, He's not there. He lost foundation, a lost favor. Thirdly, we see a lost family. The last phrase of this verse 6 is one of the most devastating predictions in the Bible. He says, because thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Did you read that? We, we, we think, I don't, yeah, I'm busy. I, I don't need God right now. I got too much other going. I'll handle life. I, I'll get through without it right now. But God says, when you forget me, I forget your kids. And you don't need a more glaring example than the United States of America. In 1962, we decided we didn't need God in this country. We're not going to pray publicly anymore. We're not going to read the Bible in our public schools. We're taking him out. And today we scratch our heads and wonder what's happened. I'll tell you what happened. We gambled with our family and we lost. You know, there's something about family that kind of gets our attention, doesn't it? A moment ago when these kids were up here, it's kind of scary, you know. They move around enough to where you think, don't fall off of there, you know. And, and when one of them kind of missteps, we all go, you know, like, especially if it's your kid. Like, there's just something about family. There's just something about your child. It gets your attention. 
When your family's hurting, when people you love are hurting, there, there's something that goes on inside of you and, and, and you want to respond. Why? Because children are inheritance of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. And no matter how good life is, when your family is hurting, we hurt. I want to ask you something. Are you trading your family for what you're living for right now? You may not think it's a big deal to reject God. You may not think it's not a big deal to stay out of church. You may not think it's a big deal to, to not have a spiritual home. But I'm telling you, we're trading our kids. Lot in the Old Testament should have listened to Abraham. Abraham was giving him some wise counsel as his uncle. But Lot disregarded the old man. I know where I want to go. I know what I want to do. And Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom. And it's not long until Sodom is dwelling in that, or Lot is dwelling in that wicked city of Sodom. In fact, he's sitting at the gate. And the theologians tell us that that means he was, he was holding some kind of political office there. Perhaps he was the mayor of the city of Sodom. We don't know exactly. But Lot is very comfortable now in the city of Sodom. I don't need God's will. I don't need God's direction. I don't need God's favor, God's foundation. I don't need that stuff. I know what I want. I know what I need. But when the fire and brimstone began to fall upon Sodom, Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which had married his daughters, and said, Up, get ye out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed to them as one that mocked. You see, he had gambled. And lost. Oh, Lot became cultural. Oh, he fit right in with the culture. Nothing peculiar about Lot. Nothing holy about Lot. He was accepted by everybody in town, but lost his family. Eli in the Old Testament was a priest, a spiritual leader, but he got cold-hearted, got indifferent, got apathetic. He didn't care how his sons were living. He didn't care what was going on in the temple. He didn't care about the worship. He didn't, he didn't care about those things. And in the process, he lost his family. David got casual. It was time for kings to go to battle, 2 Samuel chapter 12, but David sat still in Jerusalem, and we know the rest of the story. David got casual, but he lost his family. Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived, and yet he loved many strange women. The word strange there is speaking of women who were worshiping false gods and idolatry, and Solomon loved those women, and he got carnal and lost his family gambled and lost. And finally, we see a lost future. The verse begins, verse 6, with my people are destroyed. Everything we did yesterday and all that we do today will somehow affect tomorrow. Now, we have the idea today that we think, well, you know, i got to take care of things today. And I'm going to live for today. I'm going to be happy today. I'm going to meet my needs today. I'm just going to worry about now. Listen, everything you did yesterday, everything you will do today will affect tomorrow. We may think, oh, it doesn't matter that I'm throwing away the knowledge of God. It doesn't matter that I'm throwing away the favor of God. It doesn't matter that I'm not diligent with my family. But everything you're doing today is going to affect your tomorrow. I made a note when I wrote this message. It was June 24th. Now, I didn't look at this message again until a couple days ago. 
I'm preaching it today. But I didn't write it today. I didn't prepare it today. I didn't, I didn't pray for the message today. I'm just delivering it today. You see, what I did on June 24th affects my life two months later. Today. What I do today will affect tomorrow and two months from now and in eternity. There are two stories in the Bible of men who gambled. One is told by Jesus in Luke chapter 15. He said a certain man had two sons. And the younger said unto his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. In other words, this younger son was concerned about today. I want my inheritance. I want it now. I don't want to wait till you die. I don't want to wait till the right time. I, I want it now. I want to live for now. I want to live for today. I want to be happy right now. I don't care about how much more I could have later. I don't care about the future. I want now what's mine. The Bible says the father divided unto them his living. Not many days after, the younger son gathered together all and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of the country who sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he fain would have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I'll arise and go to my father, and I'll say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. So he arose and went into his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion on him and ran and fell upon his neck and kissed him. And he said, bring hither the, the, the best robe and put it on him and shoes upon his feet and a ring upon his hand and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Here was a young man that gambled, threw it all away. Until one day he came to himself. Oh, would you come to yourself today? Would you come to your senses today? Would you return back to God today? Would you get tired of just living for the now and for what's acceptable to you and realize that your future's at stake, your family's at stake, the favor of God is at stake, the very foundation of your life is at stake. You must return to God. For the next chapter, Jesus told another story. He said there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which laid at his gate full of sores desiring to be fed with the, do with the crumbs from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried and in hell. He lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. You see, here was a man that gambled with God about his soul. He thought, I'll deal with that later. Now's the time to make money. Now's the time to enjoy my riches. Now's the time to enjoy the now. And he gambled with his soul. But one day, the ship of life took a turn. And death came. 
And what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Are you gambling your eternity away this morning? Oh, listen, Jesus Christ invites you to come to him. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You can come to the Father today, and when you come to Christ today as your Savior, he will save you. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He'll give you eternal life. You can do something today about your soul that will affect not just tomorrow, but your entire eternity. Don't gamble with God. Let's pray. Father, would you help us today to see the severity of a controversy with God? Lord, it seems all around us in this world we live without truth, without mercy, without knowledge of God. And on every hand we see cursing, we see killings, we see stealing, we see adultery, we see blasphemy. And Lord, only you know when the ship of our life will take a turn and all that we've gambled could be lost. So, Lord, I pray today that you would awaken us out of our sleep, that you would bring us to ourself as you did the prodigal. Bring us home to God today. His heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I wonder how many in this room today would say, Brother Getch, I, I'm a child of God. I'm a Christian. I, I know the Lord is my Savior. But I, I've been gambling with my foundation. I've been gambling. I, I, I can't really honestly remember the last time I, I really read the Bible and got something out of it. This summer has just been a whirlwind. and I just haven't had the time to even read God's Word, to hide any of it in my heart, much less live any of it. I feel like I've lost the, the favor of God. I, I just don't seem to have his presence, his power as I once did. My family's shaky. My, my family's starting to, to show signs of trouble, difficulty. You'd say, Brother Getch, will you pray for me? I need to return today to my foundation. I need to return to my favor with God. I need to return to my responsibilities with my family. I don't want my future to be risked by a gamble with God. And God spoke to my heart. Pray for me. Would you lift your hand all over this building as a Christian today? God speaking to your heart. God bless you. Let me place your hand down. I wonder, are you here today? And you'd say, preacher, if my life ended today, if God rocked the boat of my life in death. Suddenly my life ended. I have no idea where I'd spend eternity. I have no idea if I'd be in heaven or hell. I need to quit gambling with time and with my soul. I need to get an answer from the Bible. I need to become a Christian. I need to trust Christ as my Savior. Pray for me. Would you lift your hand this morning all over this building? God bless you. God bless you. Someone else today, pray for me. I need to get this matter settled of eternity. I need to quit just throwing my future to the wind, thinking it'll all work out. I'll have time to deal with it later. No, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Settle that matter today. Lord, would you speak in hearts today in this closing moment of this service? I pray as we extend this invitation, not to this church or to me as the preacher or even to this altar, but as we extend this invitation to come to you, may our hearts be willing and ready to respond to what you've so told us to do today. We'll thank you for it. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'd like to ask you to stand if you can. Brother Williams is going to sing a hymn of invitation. There are folks here at the front from our staff that would be happy to meet you here. 
If you lifted your hand as a Christian, I'm going to invite you to come and spend a moment at this altar. If you're here today and you raised your hand and said, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm not sure I'm a Christian. I'm going to ask you to slip out and come as well. Let someone take the Bible and show you how to settle that today. As Brother Williams begins to sing, would you slip out and come? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Just slip out and come. Look full in his wonderful face. Don't gamble, you'll and have another opportunity. Of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Heads are bowed, the piano continues to play, others are continuing to come. Folks doing business with the Lord, communicating with him. Do you need to come, ma'am? Sir, do you need to slip out this morning and come? God wants to meet that need in your life. He wants to fill that void. He wants to place you in his hands secure for all of eternity. Don't gamble with your soul today. Don't gamble with your life today. He that saveth his life shall lose it. He that loseth his life for my sake and the gospel's the same shall save it. Just another stanza as folks are being dealt with. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for the preaching of your word. And Lord, I pray that we would take account of what we've just heard and examine our own life. May we not be found gambling with you. Lord, as we've been reminded of the great loss, may we determine today to awaken, to know you, and to be right with you. Lord, help us to make you the Lord of our life in every area and in every way. And we'll praise and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>